to our third session of our webinar series, Lunch and Learn on International Trade, uh, with the question, chance or pitfall for energy transition? Today, um, our session is called Everyone Wants a Piece of the Raw Material Cake. And we're having a dedicated session as to the question of trade policy and renewable energies. Uh, during the last sessions, we have been giving an overall view of um, how raw materials trade and policies is linked to trade and the EU trade policy, and uh, more specifically also to fossil uh, energy. That was last session with a specific view on Colombia, the EU Colombia FTA, and uh, the specific ISDS provisions that Colombia um colombian bilateral investment treaties have and that have led to many ideas claims against colombia um today we're going to have a closer look at one specific free trade agreement the eu is very keen to sign which is the eu indonesia agreement i am uh, very happy to have rahmi hertagdi with me uh, she's from tni Indonesia. Uh, she's a researcher with DNI and is specifically working on that issue. Before I hand over to you, just some basic information on other uh, agreements the EU is currently negotiating, and that include a chapter on raw materials and trade, raw materials, energy, and trade. Um, so we have some which I'm specifically working on, which is EU Mexico and EU, EU Chile, which actually might be signed this year. The EU is very keen on signing, uh, specifically also because in Mexico as well as in Chile, there's important raw materials they need for the energy transition. Well, in Chile, we know there's lithium. 70% of EU's lithium comes from Chile which is why the EU is very keen on securing access, but there's also copper, of course. Mexico has also quite some important lithium reserves, uh, but also some other uh, raw materials the EU is interested in. And then of course there's EU Australia. Australia also has some interesting lithium reserves. There's EU New Zealand, which has not so interesting raw materials reserves, but still there is a chapter specific on uh, EU raw material uh, on raw materials and energy. And uh, then we have have EU India and EU uh, Indonesia, and I'm hoping I'm not forgetting anyone uh, any uh, agreement that has such a chapter. Just to tell you that while well, New Zealand might actually be the uh, next one and being presented for ratification before end of this year. Uh, Australia is still being negotiated as our EU India and EU Indonesia. And in, in, in Indonesia, as far as I understand, the specific interest is on nickel. Please, Rahmi, will you tell us a bit more about how these negotiations uh, are currently uh, developing? What is at stake? And what are you doing in Indonesia to? Um, yeah, to work on this and also maybe to build up some resistance against this agreement as civil society. I will stop sharing my screen. So now you can share your screen. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bettina. And um, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me in this uh, learning process. Uh, I think um, I will present, uh, hopefully, a brief explanation about Indonesia SEPA. Now, can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay, wait. I need to slide so. Okay, I will try to share uh, the perspective from Indonesian side, but I will try to start from the global perspective and then come to specifically to Indonesian uh, side. Yeah, so yeah, as you know that uh, Indonesia has become one of the vortexes of competitions yeah, for the access to the minerals that uh, the world needs today, um, especially uh, for countries that uh, are looking for critical mineral supply outside uh, China. 
And uh, as we know that the disruptions, uh, we are facing the disruptions of supply chains and uh, the disruptions of critical minerals is caused also by the significant dependence uh, of global trade on production supplies uh, con concentrated in only a few uh, countries, yeah, uh, which is of course dominated by, by China. And as you can see in the screen here, yeah, uh, I took it from the International Energy Agency report. Uh, and you know that the, uh, the mineral productions uh, and processing is only concentrated in at least three big producer countries. Uh, and for example, for earth elements sequentially only controlled by China, United States, and Myanmar while for lithium sequentially uh, controlled by Australia, Chile, and China, and for nickel, as Bettina said, that respectively controlled by Indonesia, uh, Philippines, and uh, Russia. And according to the uh, IEA report, uh, the concentrations of uh, mineral uh, productions and processings in only a handful of countries uh, will make the supply even more vulnerable. Uh, to political instability, geopolitical risk, and possible export restrictions. For example, the global supply chains of uh, rare earth elements and nickel was recently disrupted by export restriction uh, policies imposed by uh, China and Indonesia. And you know that the race to secure mineral supply is not only caused by the uh, supplies concentrated in only few uh, countries, but also due to the limited reserves, uh, especially that owned by the G7 uh, countries. If you can see on the screen, uh, based on the OECD report in 2022, it mentions that uh, the mineral reserves owned by the, seven, the G7 countries are insufficient to meet their uh, domestic industrial demand. And uh, yeah, that if you see in the screen that the green frame shows that uh, the reserve yeah, uh, that are located in G7 countries. And the OECD also mentions that uh, the majority of G7 countries are not the largest producers uh, of critical uh, minerals and also are not the big players in the mineral processing uh, industry for key commodities in green technology, uh, uh, yeah, such as lithium, cobalt, bismuth, rare earth, et cetera. And so therefore, uh, I think during the uh, G7 meeting in Germany last year yeah, in 2022, the G7 trade ministers agreed that the G7 countries will intensify the multilateral, regional, and bilateral trade corporations to address uh, export restrictions and threat barriers uh, at the international level. And we know that also last year, the EU commissions uh, uh, announced that they will pushing uh, the Critical uh, Raw Materials Act, yeah? uh, and it is also aimed uh, to diversifying trade yeah, to ensure the supply chains uh, of critical uh, minerals uh, for the EU. And we know that uh, it will carry uh, uh, by the increasing trade cooperations with several strategic countries. Uh, Bettina uh, uh, has mentioned several free trade agreements, but most the uh, strategic partners that the EU won't target like Australia, Chile, Mexico, etc. And I know that although Indonesia is not a priority country for the EU right now, yeah, but the cooperation with Indonesia uh, will also provide the potential for uh, European Union to access the critical minerals. And you know that the EU has been negotiating an economic partnership agreement with Indonesia for almost, I think, seven years. Yeah? And because it launched in 2016, and it has been negotiating for almost 13 rounds. And the next round uh, of negotiations will be held in Brussels, uh, I think around May uh, 2020. And, uh, and you know that uh, based on the EU Indonesia scooping paper that launched in 2016, 
uh, the EU claim that uh, Indonesia's uh, energy and raw materials present both great opportunities uh, and also challenges for the EU. Uh, it is because the EU uh, worried about some uh, of Indonesia's protectionist policies in the energy sector and would potentially hinder the mineral supply needed for the EU. Uh, such measures like uh, include an export ban on, on unprocessed mineral introduced in 2014, local content requirements, and then the prohibitions of the privatizations of state-owned enterprises in the natural resources, as well as the energy subsidies um, issues. And in fact, the Indonesia's policy regarding the export ban on minerals, uh, raw minerals, uh, and domestic processing uh, obligations yeah, to increase the added value of uh, productions there yeah, also has been challenged by the EU at the WTO and we know that Indonesia lost at the first stage but I think on 8 December last year the government of Indonesia submitted uh, uh, an appeals to the WTO and I think I also saw that Indonesia also submit a new case against EU in the relations to the uh, anti-dumping on, if I'm not wrong, yeah, anti-dumping anti -dumping or subsidies on steel uh, products uh, in the EU. I think that's that's part of the scenario uh, of the previous uh, lawsuits where Indonesia lost at the time. And I can say that now with large reserves of nickel and several critical minerals for EV, battery productions, Indonesia is increasingly confident in continuing its national industrialization agenda. And, and you know that the Indonesian government's decisions uh, to downstreaming nickel and several other mineral commodities is not only simply following the, the new trend uh, of increasing global mineral demand for green technology, uh, but the downstreaming mining commodity agenda has been a decision taken by the government since a decade uh, ago. This policy actually is a claim by the government to fulfill the mandate of our constitutions, uh, which states that all natural wealth uh, is owned by the states and used for the welfare of the people. And Article 33 of the constitutions has been the justifications for the government of Indonesia since the era of uh, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono's leaderships, which carried out the economic model uh, of nationalism, yeah, which was then followed by the President Jokowi uh, recently. And it becomes a basis for uh, governments right now in pushing nationalizations agenda for Indonesia's uh, mining sector. And I think uh, we had previously the first nationalizations, uh, the first resource nationalizations during Sukarno's era. So that's the first nationalizations of our uh, natural resources, especially in the mining sector. But uh, now the nationalizations agenda in our mining sector was regulated in the mining a law number four, uh, 2009, and it issued during the Dino presidency. And this was carried out with at least two main agendas. Yeah, First, uh, the domestic processing requirement. So the article 102 and 103 of the mining law required mining companies to process and refine mining products domestically in the country prior to export to increase the added value of mineral uh, commodities. And this policy or the law was followed by the export ban policy uh, on raw minerals commodity. And the second agenda is nationalizations of foreign uh, mining companies. In the article 112 of the mining law uh, aims to nationalize the foreign mining companies which oblige foreign owned mining industries to progressively divest its majority shareholder to the Indonesian government to state owned enterprise or uh, local uh, industries. So um, now we have the new law. Uh, it's the mining law number three uh, year 2020, but it has similar obligations and requirements that uh, 
that already uh, stipulated in the previous law. Um, well, I can say that the domestic processing uh, obligations yeah, uh, is really important for uh, Indonesia, especially for developing countries to realize uh, the sovereign economic uh, development, which uh, breaks the predatory extractivist uh, pattern uh, of development that really heavily relies on the export of primary commodities. And this model of development has been uh, a legacy of uh, colonialism where Indonesia was only an exporter of raw materials or raw minerals without benefiting from the commodity production process, especially its downstreaming uh, side. And well, I can say that the government of Indonesia should have realized that free trade agreements or free trade liberalizations through international trade agreements is not the right answer uh, if Indonesia would like to strengthen the downstreaming industrialization agenda. It's because the rules of liberalization uh, require the harmonizations of national regulations with the provisions of international trade agreements, and it will only narrow the government's uh, policy space uh, in defending our national uh, interests. And I think the European uh, unions lawsuits uh, against Indonesia export restriction policy should be an important reflection here uh, for the government of Indonesia in international trade diplomacy, especially when they are negotiating various free trade, uh, free trade agreements uh, such as that uh, being carried out with the European Union in Indonesia. And uh, I think uh, why would, uh, the government would like to a push uh, for the uh, industrializations because in his inauguration speech yeah, in 2019 in this, for, this, for the second term of uh, President Joko Widodo, uh, he's committed to driving the transformations of Indonesian economy in the next five years of his leadership until 2024. And it will be next year. We will have another elections for uh, president election uh, in next year. So this national economic transformations was carried out uh, to transform Indonesia uh, from an exporting country to a highly competitive product exporter through downstream industry. And as you know that beside nickel to uh, at least to consistent with the agenda, once again, the president Jokowi reannounced that the government would ban bauxite export, raw bauxite, uh, bauxite ore exports, which will start in June 2023, uh, and also require the same uh, to process and refine bauxite in the country. And in the future, there will be several Indonesian government policies regarding the export ban of other raw mineral commodities like copper and tin, I think, because uh, if I heard in several presentations from the government, they have uh, one uh, like a blueprint how Indonesia would like to develop the uh, industry, national industry, specifically to respond to the, uh, the needs, yeah? uh, or Indonesia would like to be the hub of EV battery productions in the region, at least. And they, they already identify some uh, essential minerals that Indonesia has, and all these minerals will later uh, be banned by the government to be export in the raw materials. And yeah, because uh, in 2019, the government uh, released uh, a president regulations yeah, uh, about the how Indonesia should prioritize industries on uh, EV uh, battery productions in Indonesia. So that's become a basis why Indonesia is really pushing for uh, the uh, agenda itself. And um, related to the EU, Indonesia, USEPA, I think it's uh, become, I think, yeah, based on the Indonesian national agenda and how the EU interest would like to uh, uh, Secure yeah, the the, raw, uh, the minerals, the critical minerals, uh, especially from in, from Indonesia. It will it will make uh, a difficulty 
on how uh, the negotiations will uh, conclude uh, uh, because they expect that this year they can conclude the, ne the, the negotiations this year. But I think there are still uh, several issues that cannot be concluded. One of these, uh, one of it is the uh, issue of energy and raw materials chapter, I think. And um, as you know that the EU has a specific chapter on energy and raw materials, yeah. Uh, and the chapter is also being proposed and discussed in the Indonesia EU SEPA uh, itself. And unfortunately, because we don't have the uh, the updates, current text of negotiations, yeah. So uh, we can uh, only access the general informations uh, from the EU uh, Commission's websites. And if you see in the general informations related to the energy and raw materials, uh, I think. Uh, the provisions on energy and raw materials would govern general disciplines and commitments yeah? uh, concerning trade in goods, services, and investment uh, that will apply to raw materials and energy, including, I think, yeah, uh, the uh, eliminations of import and export duties and other restrictions relating to uh, import or exports. And this, the scoping, uh, the scope of the commitment will, will also include measures related to trade investment in raw materials, yeah. Uh, and also uh, the issue of energy from renewable resource sources, electrical energy as well as hydrocarbon. So I think the EU in this energy and raw materials chapter, the EU will not only targeting the critical minerals, but then the energy markets in Indonesia, uh, as you know that the energy market in Indonesia is still uh, monopolized by the state-owned enterprise uh, by PLN. And the EU would like to liberalize this uh, energy sector, uh, especially when the government uh, uh, set the, the price or the tariffs of the electricity. So I think uh, that's become the scope uh, of the energy and raw materials uh, under the Indonesian chapter. And uh, from the general disciplines, I think the EU would reflect yeah, uh, these uh, issues at, uh, at least into three uh, objectives. First, as you see that on the transparency, the EU uh, really encourages transparency in the process of licensing because there, there is a lot of issues when it comes to the export and import licensing in Indonesia. So I think the EU would like to address that kind of uh, issues. Uh, second, on the market access and non-discriminations, uh, the, the EU uh, uh, aims to eliminate export restrictions, including the eliminations in uh, all yeah, uh, export monopolies and government interventions in the price setting of energy goods and raw materials. And the third, uh, on trade in sustainable energy goods, the EU would like also promotes yeah, through uh, various uh, policy measures, for instance, like regulatory measures, uh, standards, and incentive programs. But perhaps uh, it also explored under the trade and sustainable uh, chapter, yeah, the TSC chapter. They also discuss about what kind of standard that we are going to use for the energy and raw materials, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, because limited access of the tax, yeah, of the agreement, uh, it has made uh, difficult for me to see how far that the arrangement uh, for the three matters mentioned. Uh, are included in the commitment of the both parties uh, in this agreement. But referring to the Indonesia EU SEPA scoping paper, for example, at least uh, there is a need to further examine how the agreement reached by the parties relates to several EU concerns regarding the policies uh, implemented by the Indonesia. For example, uh, first, uh, the extent to which the, re the rules regarding export and import licensing duties and restrictions, as well as prohibitions on export and import monopolies are contained in the chapter on trade in goods. 
or is there a specific commitment by both parties related to the issue of prohibiting the applications of local content requirements in the performance requirements uh, article and investment dispute settlement provisions in the investment chapter? We still don't know about that including the matter of provisions limit, limiting the monopoly of state uh, owned enterprise because so far from my understanding that uh, the Indonesia USEPA also has a specific chapter on state owned uh, enterprise uh, how they want to liberalize this state owned enterprise in the energy sector uh, specifically um, but it's really interesting when I found in the last report uh, of the 13th round a negotiation, uh, the next negotiations will discuss intensify uh, first the, I think, uh, the trade and sustainable development chapter, the energy and raw materials uh, chapter, and the investment court system. So for people that who are asking whether Indonesia has investment chapter and IS, uh, ICS, yes. Uh, the EU has uh, negotiating with Indonesia uh, an investment chapter that also contain investment court uh, system. And uh, also I think for some people who are following the uh, debate on bilateral investment treaties, specifically in Indonesia. Indonesia had revised the bilateral investment treaties, the substantia of uh, our bilateral investment treaties uh, in 2004, 2006, uh, sorry, uh, 2014 at the time. And the government had created a new template of uh, investment treaties for Indonesia. But unfortunately, uh, there's, uh, the government still, uh, still acknowledge that the ISDS mechanism is really important, but the government uh, has, a, has a argumentations yeah, that even we put ISDS mechanism in the BIT or other investment treaties, uh, the thing is, if we can control the substance, for example, how we put a strong, uh, a strong state, uh, a strong sentence about the definition of investment or uh, other elements that uh, will not put ISDS lawsuit as a direct uh, lawsuit, for example, and it has. Uh, and obligations or uh, requirements that uh, you need a consent on that. So they, they believe that if we control the substance, so we can avoid the ISDS mechanism. But for the civil society in Indonesia, the, the high call is no ISDS mechanism uh, in every trade agreements uh, that ratified by the Indonesia, for example. And, and we know that, uh, the investment court system is still adopt the similar approach with ISDS mechanism, and it's still open a potential lawsuit for Indonesia. And for sure, with the increase of the list of raw minerals export bans by the Indonesian government, the country will more than likely face uh, various threats of lawsuits from uh, foreign investors. And you know that from the past Indonesia's experiences of investor lawsuits uh, cases, 75% at least of investment disputes came from mining, uh, foreign mining companies like Churchill Mining, Planet Mining, uh, Newmon, India Metal Ferro Alloys, and Freeport. As closing, I just want to remind that in the next round of negotiations uh, on May 2023 in Brussels, both negotiators uh should be monitored because uh the i think they will in really intense to discuss and will really push the conclusions of the agreement by uh, the end of this year so it's really critical right now for us uh especially for indonesian civil society because uh the the negotiations is really secret we couldn't access any text and our parliament also uh, didn't really know about the process. So, I mean, 
it's really serious for us, uh, especially when we are talking about transparency and public participations in the process of negotiations. I will stop here and thank you. <laughs>